Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 19th episode of the Startup Boston podcast, where I interview entrepreneurs, investors, and influencers in the Boston startup community to uncover actionable advice and stories from their experiences. I'm your host, Nick Dupuy. Today's guest is Ellen Shiza. Ellen started her career in program management at Microsoft, then moved to Kickstarter as a product manager, where she was the 50th employee. In 2015, she joined Lola Travel as the first employee as the VP of product. Lola Travel is Paul English's second travel company and connects travelers with in-house personal travel consultants who help you plan, book, and manage your travel, allowing you to have a more personalized and rewarding trip. A few things that Ellen talks about in this episode are the differences between designing product for web and mobile, how to break into a product position, why Lola uses real travel consultants instead of bots, misconceptions about the PM role, and what to think about before getting your MBA. And if you like today's episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on iTunes so you can get all of my new episodes right on your podcast app as soon as they're released. Enjoy today's episode. Ellen, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. Appreciate having you. We're going to talk about Lola and uh, product, but first give us an introduction about yourself. Yeah, so I'm the VP of product here at Lola, and before this, I was a product manager at Kickstarter for the backer experience, and I started my career out at Microsoft working on Office Mobile, and for my undergraduate work, I was at Olin College of Engineering out in Needham, so right near here. It's actually, it's been really interesting to be at Lola now. So when I was at Kickstarter, I joined and I was the 50th employee. And the company was about five years old at that point. And at Lola, we're close to 50 now. Um, But I actually started here as the first employee. And it's very interesting to see how different Lola is at this size compared to what Kickstarter was. Mm -hmm. And the mobile focus is definitely one of those differences. Kickstarter had been a web product for a long time. And we released, I think, the first iPhone app while I was working there. Whereas here at Lola, we started mobile first. So how does developing a product for mobile differ from that for the web? I think it's really interesting because you're thinking about fitting things in in a different way. When you're designing a web-based product, you can kind of assume some context. Someone's sitting down at their computer and they're doing a specific thing. Or if you're doing responsive stuff, they might be looking at it on their phone still. So that's more similar to the mobile use case. Whereas with mobile, you kind of have to think, I'm getting the 30 seconds when this person pulls out their phone. I think most people pull their phone out for 150 times a day for like 30 seconds to a minute each. How am I going to fit into that type of time? They're not necessarily, like you said, sitting down focused on that. They're doing other things at the same time. You've worked in program and product management for most of your career. What do you love most about this part of the business? Everything. I'm always, I know everyone is different. So I feel like I should not judge people who don't want to work in product, but I can't imagine doing anything else. I think the fun part about it for me is it's a job that justifies being curious about every other role because you have to interact with everyone. So I'm not a marketing expert the way our CMO, Robert Burgess, but I can learn from him about what he's doing. And I've gotten to learn a ton about content and brand strategy and paid media and how he thinks about all of those problems and as they relate to our product. How is it? How is the PM role at Lola different than at Microsoft? It's been really fun here. So I was the first person who effectively started working on Lola, which means I've gotten to define what I do. And frankly, a lot of that is just stepping in to do whatever's needed. Um, But one of the things I like about smaller companies, and especially the very beginning of companies, is the roles get crafted more around the people. So for me, that's definitely the case. I've done a lot of different things while I've been working here, but kind of for everyone on the team. We had someone recently who actually had been a travel agent, was helping people plan travel. But he really liked looking for bugs and was a great quality person. And we just moved him onto my team to be a product quality associate, which is super, super interesting. Whereas at Microsoft, if you joined in the PM ladder, there was like the check boxes of like, these are the six things you will be good at, and you will only be good at these things. And if you tried to add value in a different area, it was like you were stepping on someone's toes, even if you like naturally liked it or were good at it. And if you had a weakness in one of the areas they thought you should be good at, even if you were really strong in the others, it was like a deal breaker for them. And that was really frustrating. Yeah, I think that's a good point. It's, It's flexible. You can move around more and work on different things. Um, so if someone wants to start their way into product management, how do you recommend they do it? Because like if someone wanted to be a software developer, they could take classes on uh, in computer science, but you can't really do much with product management unless 
you had experience in it. So how do you recommend yeah. somebody breaks into it? Yeah, that's definitely the hardest thing about product. And I've taught a lot. And that's one of the things I've struggled with is so much of it isn't just lectures you can do in a classroom. And while you can learn some fundamentals that way, the only way you can really learn it is by doing it. And so what I generally encourage people to do if they think they might be interested in product is to kind of start doing some sort of side project that they're excited about and like take some problem they have that they wish there was a product for and start thinking about what would that product be and then start to kind of write down what they wish it did, what the use cases are, um, and then kind of take it to someone. I've, I've definitely found this. A lot of product managers really like looking at products. So if you get far enough along that process and you come up with something and you take it to someone and you're like, hey, tell me what you think about this, people are very likely to give you feedback. So I would say I almost think the best way to get into product is like start thinking in a very entrepreneurial way, almost as if you are going to start a company around this thing. But you don't necessarily have to worry as much about the financial constraints or the fundraising. It's more about like, what would the product be? Did you do any side projects yourself? I love side projects. Um, I haven't been very good about the one I've been theoretically working on lately, but I like systems that force you to do them. So one of my favorite sets of side projects I did was I was at Harvard Business School last year and during spring break, we did startup lockdown and tried to build five different companies in five days. And that meant for five days in a row, I was spending 12 hours basically thinking about a space and what product I would build in that space. And it's amazing how much you can learn even in a relatively short burst. What were some of the projects that you worked on then? So one of the ones I thought was the most interesting and it's the one that always comes to mind now is we did one we called Wagger. And it was the idea of one of the people on our team wanted to buy a puppy and he particularly wanted to buy a French bulldog. And there's it was an interesting startup because there's a lot of concern around puppy mills and even ethical dog breeding and how can you do that? And it was kind of interesting to be thinking about the space of what can you do in this space that makes it better and like what is the ethical line there? I would think about it the same way as like if you're doing a product for payday loans, if you make payday loans more yeah. ethical, is that a step in the right direction or should you be trying to get rid of them altogether? Mm -hmm. And I think it was really interesting to talk to the dog breeders and talk to both people on both sides of the fence. Okay. Are there any characteristics that you find great PMs possess? Yeah. My first one is always I like when people are really curious. And I think that's just because so much of the job is just stepping in and doing whatever needs to be done that you are better off if you're curious about everything. And then you'll be able to kind of like, no matter what the task is, take some intrinsic joy about learning a new thing. Mm -hmm. Like, it's kind of fun to make a spreadsheet for the first time. And like doing QA isn't always boring. And like you, you get to pick up a lot of stuff over time, even if it's not what you are instinctively drawn to because you just want to see how it works. Mm. And be, be willing to do that as well. Yeah, I guess that that is another characteristic. Willingness to do whatever needs to be done, I think, is really important for PMs. Uh, so tell us a little bit about Lola Travel. Lola has been really exciting. So the premise of the company is that we help connect travelers with our team of in-house personal travel consultants who help you plan, book, and manage your travel. And so one of the things I love about this is we're taking some of like that logistical headache out, which hopefully lets you have a little bit more personalized of a trip or a little bit more adventurous of a trip. And I think travel is something that really enriches people's lives. And I find that really rewarding to work on. So how, how did you get involved here? Yeah, I was at Harvard. Like I just mentioned, I guess I was at Harvard Business School last year. And I spent the entire year thinking I would intern in venture capital. And as I talked to more and more venture capitalists, they pointed out that what I really like is making stuff. And I'd worked really closely with Perry Chen, the founding CEO and co-founder at Kickstarter. And I hadn't really worked with that many entrepreneurs that closely. And so the advice I got was rather than thinking about interning in venture capital, I should think about working with another founder I really respected. And it's actually interesting. I was in a class at MIT Founders Journey my last year in college. And Paul English, who's our CEO here at Lola, came to speak. And I found my notes for this recently. And like in my notes, I'm like, this person is really cool and has lots of good <laughs> ideas. Uh, and so when the chance came up to come intern at what was then Blade, which was an incubator for consumer tech projects, products and companies, I thought it'd be really co cool to come work with Paul and Bill and Paul and the rest of the team. And then the project they gave me initially was starting to look at what do personal assistance for everyone look like. And that's kind of what ended up morphing into Lola. So how has, what has been the most difficult part of developing the product here at Lola? I think the most difficult part for me here, and this is also awesome, it's we have a lot of really deep expertise in the travel industry. And we have a lot of people who are just veterans of doing startups like Paul has been doing this for a really long time. And I think what's nice about that is it gives you a little bit more confidence and a little bit more knowledge about what it's like to scale. So we spend more time thinking about what does this look like in three years? What does this look like in five years? Mm -hmm. And other companies have been at you're kind of just scrambling to get to next month. 
And I think it's an interesting challenge to be still, we still have to think about what we're going to build next month and how we're going to get there and what the most important thing is to do next. But we're also trying to bring that together with what is this longer term vision. And putting those two things together, I think, can be a little bit more challenging when you're able to grow a team this quickly and you're able to think about so many different options. How has the the scope for the app changed? Um, so at the very beginning, we were definitely thinking about generalized assistance. And so that was one big scoping change was we decided we really wanted to focus in on travel. And I think that's been a big shift. And I think you're seeing a lot of other people who started out trying to make general assistance doing that the same way as well. So some of them have changed business models. So Magic now charges $100 an hour for their service. Or Go Butler pivoted completely from being an assistant for everything with humans to being a, like an AI flight search only. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think we're definitely seeing a lot of the conversational apps trending towards having a more specific focus. Or another one is Finn, which is supposed to be a better memory. And they started charging for anything outside of that core, like scheduling of events and remembering facts. So that's been interesting to see. And I think between December and now, it's actually... It's funny to look back and see how much has changed. And some of the stuff that stands out to me the most is just things that just feel so much more professional and polished. So the first version of the app had a loading indicator, which was our old logo that was just like our internal project code logo. And it looked like the logo was filling up with liquid. And it was like one of the (laughs) least professional loading animations I had seen. Um, But now, like, if you go to our website, we have this really nice filling in of the, the Lola scope, which is our kind of our mark that accompanies our logo, which is the word name. And that's definitely changed. So I think a lot of it is that polish. And I think some of it's also just how we think about the product. And early on, we provided really few constraints. So we could start seeing how people were using it. And now that we're learning more and more from our users about what is helpful and what's confusing, we add more functionality that helps make the model work better for them. So you said that you started initially with a focus on personal assistance. Why did you then decide to focus on travel? Yeah, I think that really comes from the fact that we just have so much travel expertise in this company. So the chairman of our board is Barney Harford now. Um, He was the CEO at Orbitz recently. Mm -hmm. And obviously, Paul English and Bill O'Donnell and Paul Schwenk were all at Kayak for a long time as well. What excites you the most about Lola's future? I'm excited about everything. Um, One of the things I'm really excited about is right now our team of personal travel consultants are based in our office. Um, But obviously, we can't just keep putting everyone in our office forever. It's already pretty crowded in here, as you can see. So I'm interested in how we continue to make them more effective by giving them better tools and then how we continue to grow that team and think about that and really maintain that strong culture they've created. Why the um, the focus on using actual actual people instead of using uh, like bots, for example? Yeah, there are a lot of reasons for that. So I think in particular, Paul's always felt very passionately about this. Uh, So he also has another company called Get Human, which helps people get to a human instead of having to talk to robots on a call service line. Yeah. And he also had the red phone at Kayak, where if you found a bug, you could call into Kayak and he would answer the red phone personally, which is a story I've always really liked. Um, so I think that was kind of naturally part of what he would be doing as a founder. Uh, but I think it's also, there's so many things that humans can do still. And I think of travel as this fundamentally social thing. It's really easy to get someone started talking about their last vacation and how they planned it or their next vacation. Like I was at lunch today with our VP of engineering and one of our iOS developers, and we naturally gravitated towards talking about vacation. And I think that always has been about that human connection. And I think that's like a nice thing about being at a travel company is it makes sense to bring that back in. Were there any lessons that you had to learn early on in your PM career the hard way? I'm sure there are. Uh, Yeah. So I guess this is more entrepreneurial than just PM, but I took a year off of college after the first two years with my my friends because we wanted to have a startup. Uh, And all five of us had relatively PME skill sets. And it turns out you cannot build a company with six PMs. That is not a good idea. Um, And I think we've diversified a little bit more now. I think of the original six of us, I do product, three are designers, one's a math teacher and one's an engineer. But even so, you can see one PM, three designers and a math teacher doesn't really make much sense. (laughs) Um, So I think realizing the role the PM plays and that the PM role is only valuable when you're surrounded by a strong team of the other roles. I've always thought that it's better to hire PMs slowly. I would rather have fewer PMs and have them be overburdened a little bit and then hire when you really have to, as opposed to hiring too many PMs early on and kind of ending up in the situation where everyone's stepping on everyone's toes and everyone feels territorial and everyone wants to feel like they made the difference. And I think that early experience really helped me come up with that point of view. What do you think a lot of people get wrong about the PM role, whether it's people outside the industry or people you work with? 
So people outside the industry seem to think PMs are in charge of things, which I find to be completely baffling. Um, so like my least favorite thing is when someone, these, this is almost always management consultants. Sorry, management consultants. They'll call me and they'll say, hey, I want to get into product because I don't want to do something hard like learn how to code and I want to be in charge. <laughs> and like that's just the phone call where I'm like, okay, I don't need to talk to you anymore. Um, and I think that's always really frustrating to me as a perception. I think within the industry, it's actually been challenging for me to be in Boston. I've noticed there's a very different perception of PMs here. And like I gave a little talk to our engineering team earlier this year about how I view the role of PM and the intersection of business and design and technology and how you fill in your PM team to balance out the skill sets that the rest of the company has to make sure you're going in the right direction. And that's part of why I like our PM team here. We're very focused on design because PM and design and quality are all together. Um, but a lot of the product management people in Boston are a little bit more old school. It's a little bit more about Gantt charts and project management certifications and all this stuff I don't really know anything about. Mm -hmm. And I think as a result of that, there can be more of a perception in Boston-based startups that you don't need PMs or that PMs are this other thing that I don't totally understand. And I think that's kind of a bummer because I think in San Francisco and Seattle and New York, everyone has a much clearer view of what the PM role is. So what would you say to someone who thinks that they wouldn't need a PM? I think it depends on the size of the team. Um, so I usually ask people questions to start to figure out how they're doing it without the PM. Oftentimes, there's someone else in the company who's strong enough to cover for it. So one of the companies that's relatively famous for not having PMs for a long time was Stripe. And that was because they were building a developer tool. So it was easy enough for engineering leads to also take on some of the vision of how should this product work. And I think that makes sense. Um, I think it's also what stage your company is at and how long the founder is able to be PM for. Uh, and then it's also how much you can inject into other people. So I haven't actually hired any other PMs here yet. What we've been doing is I've been doing the overseeing work of product. The VP of Ops has been doing a ton of product type work on the agent console side, which is the tools our personal travel consultants use. And then each of the engineering leads has a metric they're kind of associated with. And I run the product meeting with engineering leads. So it's kind of more by having me, I can distribute the roles that would usually be condensed into PMs amongst other people on the team. When you're looking to add a PM to the team, do you look for candidates that can bring on additional skills or ones that can complement where it is you're already headed? I think, well, like everything in product, it depends. Um, for instance, here, since we are with design, I probably would never hire someone who was, I guess I shouldn't say never. In the short term, I probably would hire someone with more design skills or at least more design understanding just because that's like the tone our meetings take. That's how we work together. That's how we think about things. That's how our leadership is structured. And I don't think it would necessarily make sense for someone who's like super into process to be joining that team right now. But I think later on you can have specific gaps. So I've been, when I was a Kickstarter at one point, we needed to replace the international PM who did expansion and globalization and markets and all the payment strategy around that. And that's like a specific skill set you need. And at that point you're looking more for the specific skill set. If you were to build out a product team from scratch, how would you do that? Which is basically what you're doing. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, so yeah. I guess the way I did that, yeah, it's funny because originally it was just me and I just tried to do everything. And then I started going crazy because there's just, it's too much at a company as large as this is now for one person to do all of the, what is our direction we're going in and all the nitty gritty. And so then since I worked really closely with the designers, I tried to just make the designers into designer slash PMs uh, without much regard for what they wanted which was not my best idea um or like which skills would be harder or easier to adopt because i was just like okay well like i like design so maybe they'll like product and i think when i started realizing that there were parts of product that they did like and then there were parts that made more sense with the engineering leads that definitely helped um but we did go through a process of interviewing at one point before we came up with some of these other solutions and we were definitely looking for someone who who meshed with the team we had. And I think because you hire PM so much later after you've built out so much of a team, you do have to hire someone that everyone can work with. So you've worked at large companies and small companies in Microsoft, Kickstarter, and now Lola. What do you think are some of the benefits for working at a large company and the benefits for working at a small company? So at a large company, people will teach you things. And people will like explicitly be trying to train you. And like I said before, they're going to try to train you into this box. So you kind of have to work on holding your own shape and not getting put in the box. But you can think about learning the things they want to teach you. Um, and so like my first manager was great about critiquing my meeting notes really seriously. And I think that was really helpful for me at that point in time. Um, and people do a really good job at large companies of trying to hire and train managers to manage 
Uh, so that was interesting. I think the other cool part about being in a big company is there's so many people around you can learn from. And so I just email random PMs on products and be like, hello, I like your part of the product. Please <laughs> tell me everything you've learned at Microsoft about doing product. Uh, and people were really, really receptive and would just like hang out with me. So I could see a lot of different styles and a lot of different ways of thinking about it and people from a lot of different backgrounds. And I thought that was really exciting. Whereas at a smaller company, especially, I think that's the most valuable when you're first starting your product career. At a smaller company, you're more likely to just get thrown into it and have to figure it out. And you can learn really fast when you're doing that. But I feel like if you don't have any foundation at all, that can be frustrating because you have to make all the 101 mistakes. And I'm kind of happy someone else taught me 101 mistakes so I can make like 301 mistakes or 401 <laughs> mistakes. Um, so things that are a little bit different. For someone that wants to work at a startup, would you recommend that they say they're just they just graduated from college? Would you recommend that they first work at a large company before transferring over to a startup? Or do you think that they should dive right in? I don't think there's anything wrong with diving right in. The thing I would caution is I think people early on underestimate how much it matters who exactly they were working for. And so if you just want to go to a startup and it's a manager who doesn't seem like they'll have time to train you or doesn't seem like they're that invested in teaching you how to be a PM, that might not be the best idea as a new grad. But if you're going to a startup and you have someone who really wants to help you get to that next level, I think that makes a ton of sense. What did you learn working at a large company that you were able to then carry over into the startup? Yeah, it's funny. When I started working at Kickstarter, everyone kept being like, it must be so different. And I was like, I do I do the same thing that I used to do. It's still the same job. And I guess I kind of thought it would be more different too. But at the end of the day, like learning how to design a good user flow and think about how your user is going through the product, like sure, you spend a lot more time working on the same thing at a large company because it takes longer to ship. But like it's still the same skill you use to do it. You just do it a lot more often at a startup or like really being able to find like think about all the edge cases and find quality bugs and everything like that I think is pretty common at a big company and that's helpful and also transfer to a startup learning how to write specs in a coherent fashion I think a lot of people are really down on specs right now and I think what they're actually down on is like old school 500 page really specific documentation sometimes when I say spec I mean like I wrote a one page document and has a diagram in it and I call that a spec and I think that skill is still very useful at a startup what was the transition like for you going from a large company to a small company? Yeah, I don't think it was that bad. I don't know if this is just because I'd been, the college I went to was tiny. We only had 300 students and it was also a brand new college. So when I went, it wasn't accredited. I was part of the fifth graduating class and we spent a ton of time working on the curriculum and evangelizing this basically startup engineering school to other institutions. So I think it didn't feel too different to me. It was definitely unusual when the first day I walked in and they were like, okay, you're going to work on researching our star reminder projects feature, start writing some SQL queries. And I just kind of read a bunch of the internet and started figuring out how to write SQL from scratch. So it was definitely kind of a dive right in sort of experience. I noticed that a lot of the products that you've been involved with seem to be around helping others. Is that something that's always been important to you? Yeah, it took me a long time to figure this out. But the thing I really like doing is I like digital products that help people have like more meaningful real world lives. So like I like Lola because it helps people travel. I liked Kickstarter because it helped people to make their own creative works. Mm -hmm. My goal with Office Mobile was I really wanted it to be a product that was for people who are mobile first who'd never had desktop office. Um, the Microsoft company strategy was much more about an extension of office for people who already had it, information workers, which was disappointing to me. Uh, but yeah, I like stuff that helps people do cool work. I think it's really fun. How did you figure that out? When did that that like light bulb moment go off for you? It might have been actually Adam Siegel hosted an event called Product Debaters. And the debate I was in with was with the CTO from Wistia was about Facebook versus Twitter. And it really forced me to think about how I feel about Twitter, actually. And the thing I love about Twitter is that most of my real world friends now are people I met on Twitter. And I think it's like really interesting that this digital product lets me say things and lets me meet people who end up being really meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. Whereas with Facebook, I feel like it's just digital updates from people I already knew. So I don't feel like it's expanding my world. It's kind of right. like this Rolodex check-in thing. Yeah. And I think that was when I started thinking about that. And then with Lola, it was interesting because I'd always cared about travel, but I'd never considered working on travel. And then I was kind of like, I'm basically letting people travel more, but there's so many there's so many other more pressing problems for our country for the world like is this meaningful enough and i think for me it's i think making everyone's life a little bit better does still matter i want to talk a little bit now about getting your mba or for people getting their mba i know that you were going to harvard business school to get your mba did you ever i know you were taking a break at one point 
Have you gone back to finish it? No. So the way HBS works is you have to be there full time. And so what I did was I completed the full first year. And then I ended up not going back to stay here at Lola. Mm -hmm. Um, And HBS is really nice about this. They'll give you up to five years before you have to go back. So basically, once a semester, they email me and be like, hey, are you coming back? And I'm like, nope. And they're like, cool, <laughs> talk to you in six months. And I'm like, great. Uh, so me and the registrar have this nice email exchange going every six months. Mm-hmm. I do hope to go back eventually. So Young Me Moon, who's one of the associate deans over at HBS, uh, is on our board here at Lola. And I really enjoy getting to see her. We have a dinner every quarter with her. And then I also see her at board meetings, which is nice. So I would like to finish. I really think there's a lot of value in structured learning. Not that I haven't learned a lot here at Lola, but that's more of a deepening of the skills I have and a broadening out from what I'm doing. Whereas when you're in a dedicated educational environment like HBS, it was like I was suddenly way over here and learning this skill that didn't feel attached to anything I'd done before. And then I kind of had to integrate it back into what I knew. So I think you can learn more diverse things in that formal environment. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that because I think there's a lot of people out there that don't think an MBA is worth it anymore. And I was interested in your side of it because obviously you you would think it was worth it. Um, is it just that structured learning environment or is there other stuff to it as well? So I think there's two types of MBAs. So there's definitely certain job functions where you have to get an MBA to advance or there's times you need to learn a specific skill that is taught in an MBA, like accounting or something like that. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes people who do that, they can come up with, rather than going full-time and paying a ton of money, maybe doing it part-time, maybe doing it online, maybe figuring out a different way to learn that specific skill. And I think at this point, there's so many different ways to learn specific skills. You should really evaluate, is it that you need to learn the skills, or is it that you really need the MBA letters on your resume, and kind of figuring that out. I think there's another set of schools that are much more about the connections and meeting the other people who are there. So most of my classmates at HBS were much more concerned with meeting each other and getting to know each other and building those relationships than they were with specific academic work we did in the classroom. Not that the academic work wasn't also important, but like the primary focus was really creating those relationships. And I think that's a different type of experience. And I think sometimes, particularly in technology, we devalue that or we don't understand what that means and why. Um, For me, it was more about what I thought I would regret more. And I have friends who um, were also admitted and decided not to go. But I think I I really like going to school. I don't think two years is as long as most people think it is. And particularly because I was comfortable dropping out. Like I think nine months is basically no time in the great scheme of things. And so I think it was worth it for me from that time perspective. Has the experience been different from what you expected? It was very tiring. I'm not sure if I expected that it would be so tiring. I'd been before, uh, when I was first admitted, they did a summer program and I was there for two days with everyone. And I think there's a difference between being really up and networking and being really on it and trying to get to know everyone for two days, which is something I actually kind of enjoy and trying to do that for nine months. And even doing it for five days for me is too much. And so like after that first week of analytics where we're all at math camp together, I was kind of like, oh God, what have I gotten (laughs) myself into? This is awful. And it probably took until March before I felt comfortable enough with everyone around me that it didn't stop being like an incredibly stressful experience every day. Um, But I think that was good for me. Like, I think it's good to grow in like uncomfortable directions. And I think that was uncomfortable. And therefore, I think it was valuable. What were some of the things that you've learned there that you've been able to carry over here into your work? Yeah. Well, so the cool thing about being the first person is you get to do everything. So I got to make a financial model at the beginning, which was not very accurate. And now we have BPF of finance who has a much more accurate financial model. But it was like fun to actually know how to make a spreadsheet and be like, okay, I'm going to project this takes this long and this will cost this much. <laughs> um, and like it was interesting to like start to like think about what some of those parameters would be and put them together. So that was cool. I also think I learned more about myself and about my limitations. And I do spend a lot of time with people here every day and working with people. And I'm better at catching myself. So for a while, our our VP of our member services who coordinates all the travel agents kept coming over to ask me questions at five o'clock every night. And I know that by the time I've been sitting here interacting with people for nine or 10 hours, I'm grumpy and I'm not great at talking at people anymore. And I would like snap at her because she would ask some question and I would be like, that's stupid. And like, they weren't stupid questions at all. They were things I hadn't communicated to her or hadn't worked out. And I wasn't being very nice about it. And it was just because I was tired. And then eventually I told her, I was like, I'm sorry. Like, please tell me this thing. I know that I'm tired right now. I like, I'm going to try to listen. 
but it might be that we need to have this conversation in the morning if it's hard. Is that okay? And like, I think going to HBS helps me realize more of those limitations and then also realize that it's a good idea to communicate those limitations to other people when necessary. I want to move now into our rapid fire questions. So the first question is, what advice would you give to your 20 year old self? I think I didn't realize soon enough that it is not all about you. And most of the times when people do something, they're not actually directly reacting to you. Like the example I just gave with talking to our VP of member services, Mm -hmm. I wasn't being grumpy at her because of her. I was being grumpy at her because of like time of day and how much time I'd spent with people. Yeah. And I think I used to react a lot more strongly. Like someone would send me a terse email and I would freak out. And it's really often not a problem. Not to take things personally. Yeah. What's your favorite project that you've backed on Kickstarter? Okay, I too. I love this. This is actually the first question I ever answered at HBS. Someone asked oh, really? this in our getting to know you go around the room. Mm-hmm. So it's two. So Creighton Berman, who's a designer based out of Chicago, made something called the jar to quantify creativity, which is basically just a mason jar with a pencil sharpener embedded into the lid. And then someone named Duncan Schott, who's a designer based out of Tokyo, Japan, made rainbow pencils, where when you sharpen them, they make little tiny half moon rainbows in the shavings. Ah. And so the two of these things together mean I now have a jar full of rainbow, rainbow. pencil shavings, <laughs> which I love. It's like so weird, but so great. Yeah, that's great. What's their favorite place that you've traveled? This is I used to have a favorite place that was an island in Australia, but I sent Paul this year when he was on vacation and he said it wasn't as good as I remembered, so that can't be my advice anymore. What was the island? Hagerstone. Okay. It was really cool. Um I don't know. I think it was also that he went in January and I went in July and the seasons are very different there. So there's that. Um, probably, I really like Indonesia a lot. I really liked diving in North Sulawesi, but I did take a trip to Jakarta last year, which was really interesting because we were doing a project at HBS with a cereal manufacturer based in Jakarta. And I got to go around and like interview high schoolers about their cereal preferences and think about how we would design a cereal product. And it was really interesting to be doing that in an emerging market and for a physical product instead of for something digital like I usually do. Uh, But I would have to go with like, I really like Indonesia. Where is somewhere that you really want to go that you haven't gone yet? Cambodia was the place I really wanted to go, but I got to go. So that's no longer my one I haven't done yet. I do really want to go to Spain. Oh, can I give you another one? Yeah. I also really want to go to Fogo Island, which is this ridiculous, artistic, architecturally very cool, tiny, like, I don't even want to say resort. It's like almost a retreat in Newfoundland. And so it's like out all in all this rocky outcrops. And if you've seen it before, it's this big white glass steel building and then they also have a series of cottages where they let artists do residencies and they have art shows in the building and they have a movie theater for showing films and they have like a a nice restaurant and it's really kind of like one of these rare places that's still a little bit in the middle of nowhere yeah kind of secluded and then when you check in they introduce you to a local person who takes you around the island and introduces you to the community Uh, it sounds so cool but it sounds interesting it takes like 13 hours to get there or well, so you can either take a 13-hour ferry plus like an eight-hour drive, or you have to fly to Toronto and then to Gander and then to somewhere else. It's very complicated. Mm. I really want to go. What's the favorite blog post that you've written? Okay, so this is a hard one. I do like the one of lessons I learned at HBS, but I think I'm biased because the most people read that one, and I also go reread it to remember mm. what I learned because it's amazing how quickly experiences slip away. But I also like the one that is kind of like my little how-to guide for how to do your first project if you want to get into product management. And Mm -hmm. I like that one because I've got a lot of emails from people telling me that it helped them get into product management. And that's cool. Like, it's nice to feel useful. Which which of your blog posts was the most difficult to write? Yeah. So there's one that's called I'm Angry Because I'm Afraid. And I wrote it after Julian Horvath left GitHub. Um, And I really... The only reason I... Not the only reason. The thing that was like really the spark that made me sit down and write it that night was because the wife of the co-founder of GitHub who'd been asked to leave tried to compare her husband's departure to Perry Chen's departure from Kickstarter, which was not the same thing at all. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because like I felt this fierce loyalty to defend these people that I worked for. And like I definitely feel the same thing here too. And that was important to me. But it was interesting how much it ended up resonating with people. But when I read it the next morning, I was like, why did I put this on the internet? (laughs) Why did I do this to myself? And I was like sitting there like... I refused to leave my bedroom and I was just like sitting there eating ice cream like, what have I done? My career is over. No one will ever hire me again. 
because it was like this very vulnerable, honest thing that was, I'm afraid I won't get to work in technology because I'm a woman and like, I love this job so much and I'm afraid people will make it hard for me to do or take it away from me. Um, but it's hard to say that publicly to lots of people who aren't you. Yeah. Yeah. That's scary. What are some of your favorite PM tools? I write a lot of email. really like email. No. I really like Day One, which is an iOS and Mac journaling app. Okay. Um, I think a lot of what I do is write, and I think that's why I tend to like writing tools. I also really like Google Docs. Uh, I like Trello. We use Trello at Kickstarter. We don't use Trello here. Here we use a combination of GitHub issues with ZenHub and a spreadsheet and a Google Doc. What's something about you that most people don't know? When I was in elementary school, I went to summer on the farm camp and learned how to churn butter and how to do everything as people did on farms in the 1800s. And the reason I did this was because it was a requirement to do farm camp before you could do archaeology camp. (laughs) And my best friend in elementary school wanted to be an archaeologist because she watched Indiana Jones. And so the next summer we went to archaeology camp. And I'm proud to say she's now an archaeologist. And I got to visit her and dig at Pompeii. Wow. Oh, at Pompeii. With her when she was researching there. That was cool. Do you have any favorite blogs or books? Yes, very many. Um, My least favorite thing about books and technology is that every technology person only recommends nonfiction or like how-to books, which I think is like extremely limited. I don't understand why people do that. Um, So I try to make a point of reading most of the popular fiction that comes out, which I think is, I think it's like a nice lens to see what people are thinking about and how people are considering the world right now. Oh, oh, this is good. So lately what I've been doing is I subscribe to this email newsletter called The Skim. And every time The Skim has a Skim Reads book at the bottom, I always immediately buy that book and then I read it that Friday evening after work. So what's been your most recent purchase? So I got a book last night, which is called The Sun in Your Eyes, which is about two women who become close friends in college and then fall apart and then become close friends and then fall apart again. So I just started that and I've been enjoying it so far. And you can blow through books, right? I Yes, yeah. I read a lot. I really like reading. It's it's funny because people ask if it's a hobby and I just I can't imagine my life without reading books. So it doesn't really feel like a hobby or people ask, where do you find the time to read all the books? But I don't I don't know. I just read them a lot. How long does it take you to read a typical book? A couple hours. Really? Like two to three. Wow. Like if I sit down on a Saturday and all I do is read books, I will get through three or four. I'm very jealous. It's really fun. What's another startup in Boston you're most excited about? Oh, my example is always drafted. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm really excited about QZM. So QZM is like a museum tech startup where they're helping museums do a better job of using technology to tell their visitors more about the exhibits. Um, so the founder, Brendan Siaco, has always been excited about the art world and things like that. And I think, I think getting people out to museums and getting them to see the context that surrounds their lives is really interesting. And I think it's cool that we have technology to enable people to do that better now rather than just like the headsets that play when you you press the buttons yeah Yeah. just a few final questions to close out where can people find out more about lola travel yes you can learn more about lola at lolatravel.com as you might expect Uh, and there's also a link from there to the app store we do have a wait list but we're trying to get people off that as quickly as we can so i'd encourage people to download it the sooner you do the sooner you will be off the wait list which is nice and where can people connect with you online yeah, I'm easiest to connect with, as you might guess from our earlier discussion on Twitter. So I'm at Ellen Chiza on Twitter, and I'm also Ellen Chiza on Medium if you want to read things that I've written. Or basically, you can Google Ellen Chiza and you'll find everything about me in the entire world. <laughs> Do you have any parting thoughts, advice, or suggestions for the audience? No. Should I? That's fair enough if you don't. I never do. No. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much, Ellen, for uh, joining me here today. Uh, I think this has been a really good conversation. Thank you for having me. If you liked today's episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. You'll get all my new episodes as soon as they're released right on your podcast app. And if you really liked today's episode, it would mean a lot to me if you could write a review of the podcast as well. Just go to startupbostonpodcast.com slash iTunes. And remember, you can find all show notes with links at startupbostonpodcast.com. Until next time, if you have any feedback, ideas for guests, or just want to say hi, you can reach me at nic at startupbostonpodcast.com or reach out on Twitter at startupboscast. That's startup B-O-S cast. Cheers. Cheers.